السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي اسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام الى المسجد الاقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من اياتنا انه هو السميع البصير واتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني اسرائيل الا تتخذوا من دوني وكيلا ذريه من حملنا مع نوح انه كان عبدا شكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Juz number 15, Suratul Al-Isra. In the name of Allah, be entirely merciful, be especially merciful. Subhanallazhi asra bi'abdihi laylan minal masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. Exalted is he, perfect is he, Allah, who took his servant by night from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the mosque whose surroundings we have blessed. Why was his servant taken on this journey? To show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. One year before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, One year before the hijrah, the circumstances in Mecca were becoming increasingly difficult for him. The Prophet ﷺ had by now spent about 12 years in Mecca calling people to worship Allah alone. And the only response he had received in return was refusal, stubbornness, opposition, violence, mockery, false propaganda, and the list goes on. And with time, the pressure had only increased. It had intensified. And this is something that saddened the Prophet ﷺ. Because if you have been opposed for 12 years, for 12 solid years, you have been opposed, you have been repulsed, then you begin to doubt yourself even. Or even if you don't doubt yourself, you know you're doing the right thing. You wonder if you should stop doing it. Why? Because you wonder how long you are going to struggle. You find yourself weak. You find yourself incapable of continuing. So Allah with His special mercy bestowed a huge favor, a huge gift to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was that gift? The gift of Al-Isra and the gift of Al-Mi'raj. What is Al-Isra? The night journey. That in one night, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Haram is in Mecca and Masjid Al-Aqsa is in Jerusalem, Palestine. And so in one night he was taken there, taken up to the skies and then back also. This happened in one night. This was a huge favor, a huge gift of Allah. And when he was taken to Jerusalem from there, he was taken to the skies above. And this is what is known as Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. In this journey, the Prophet ﷺ was shown numerous signs as Allah mentions in this ayah. And these signs, the Prophet ﷺ was shown both in this world and also in the skies above. And this is something that gave confidence to the Prophet ﷺ. It gave him reassurance. And in this journey, we learned that the Prophet ﷺ also led all of the prophets in prayer. He met various prophets. He was shown paradise and hell. He was shown the various punishments that people were being given. So this journey was not in the realm that we are in right now. Because many people, when they learn about this, this part of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, they find it difficult to understand. Because we're thinking about it in worldly terms. How could you possibly travel in one night all the way to Jerusalem, and then the skies above, and across, and then be back while the bed is still warm? Yes, it can happen. Not according to the laws of physics that we are aware of, 
But this was a huge favor of Allah. And this is why Allah says, Subhanalladhi, perfect is Allah. Because for Him, anything is possible. For Him, anything is easy. If He wants to take His servant in one night back and forth from the sky down, He can do that. It's not difficult for Him. And why would it be difficult for Him? Because if you just observe the creation, I mean, if you look at the massive size of this universe alone, and to realize that all of this came about from nothing. It was nothing. It didn't exist. I mean, this is something that we all, that everybody wonders about. How old is this universe? When you're thinking about the age of the universe, you're thinking about the birth of the universe. And the birth of the universe implies that there was a time when this universe did not exist. So if Allah can create all of this, all of this, and we know that this universe is not just what we know of, we know that there's much more beyond this world, much more beyond what we know about. I mean, just 500 years ago, if you told somebody about germs, they would laugh at you. If you told somebody about viruses and bacteria, they would laugh at you. Why? Because this was something that human beings did not know about. So likewise, this is something that we perhaps cannot understand with our minds, with the knowledge that we have. How is it that the Prophet went on this night journey Right? And especially what people say, that he went on a winged horse. Well, the burak is not a winged horse. Alright? The Prophet ﷺ said that he was taken on the burak, and the burak is a creature. Is a creature, meaning it's a different kind of creature. That is bigger than a mule, smaller than a horse. So it looks like a horse, but it's not actually a horse. And nowhere did the Prophet ﷺ say that it had wings. Because if it had wings, yes, it, it would have to move its wings in order to fly. But the Prophet ﷺ said that its speed was the speed of sight. The speed of sight, the speed of vision. Meaning, its next step would be as far as the vision would go. So you're not talking about a rocket or a spaceship or, or anything that we are familiar with. This is something from out of this world. And that's exactly what this journey was about. Out of this world. Because this entire universe, this creation belongs to who? Allah. It belongs to Allah. And He can take His servant from one realm to another and back in no time. It is up to Him. So, Subhanalladhi, perfect is Allah, the one who bestowed this huge favor on His Messenger. And in this journey, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he returned, he returned with some gifts and some messages for us. What were the gifts? We learned the Prophet ﷺ was given three things on this journey. He was given the five daily prayers, which were initially 50. And then on Musa ﷺ's recommendation, what happened? It was reduced to uh, half and then less and less until eventually it was five. And the Prophet ﷺ felt shy to have it decreased any further. So he returned with the gift of five daily prayers, which means that before the Isra, the Prophet ﷺ prayed, but he did not pray the five daily prayers because the command was not there. And at this time, Allah gifted him the gift of prayer. Why? Because he needed this gift the most at this time. Because when you're facing the opposition of people, when you feel all alone, when you feel like your, your efforts are hardly producing any positive results, then what do you need? You need to strengthen your faith in Allah. You need to beg Him for help. You need to calm your heart by pouring out your heart, your fears, your worries before Him. You need to connect with the one who made you. The one for whom everything is possible. And what better way of connecting with Allah than through salah. When you talk to Allah and Allah listens to you, Allah hears you. So the Prophet ﷺ returned with the gift of salah. And also the concluding verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. The concluding verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. The last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah were given to the Prophet ﷺ up there. Jibreel was not sent down with those verses. Rather, he was called up in order to receive those verses. And that shows us the, 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 the value of these verses, which is why the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever recites them in the night, then these verses will be sufficient for him. Sufficient for him? You know, to deal with all his worries, his fears, his anxieties, to protect him, and also for the worship of that night. Because these verses are no ordinary verses. And also with the gift of forgiveness for those among the ummah who do not associate anything with Allah. That ultimately Allah will forgive every single muwahid. Who is muwahid? The one who believes in tawheed, that Allah, God is one having no partner. 
The Prophet ﷺ also met certain prophets. Like for example, he met Ibrahim alayhi salam. Rasulullah ﷺ said that I met Ibrahim on the night journey. And he said, O oh Muhammad ﷺ, say my salams to your ummah. Are you part of the ummah of Rasulullah ﷺ? So the Prophet ﷺ gave the amana, the amana of salam. What should we say? Alaykum <laughs> salam. Hey, Ibrahim alayhi salam, amazing, amazing man. Look at how grateful he is, how patient he is. And then we learned his dua that, Oh Allah, forgive me and forgive all the believers. And when he meets Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Give my salam to your ummah. What a great heart he had. What a huge heart he had. How loving he was. How generous he was. How concerned and caring he was. Truly when Allah praises him that he was an ummah, he was a leader, he was like a nation, then Allah has really spoken the truth. Ibrahim salam said, Say my salams to your ummah and tell them that Jannah has good fertile soil and sweet water, but it is barren. Meaning work needs to be done. There's a lot of opportunity, work needs to be done. And its plantations are subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar. Meaning when a person remembers Allah, he says these adhkar, then what happens? His Jannah, his garden, in the hereafter, in the home of eternity, that becomes beautiful. Right? Because its plantations are these words of glorification. Then the Prophet ﷺ was also shown, amongst the ayat that he was shown, he was also shown some punishments. Some punishments. So for example, we learned the Prophet ﷺ said that during the mi'raj, I saw a group of people who were scratching their chests and their faces with copper nails. So they had copper nails, so their nails were of copper, and they were scratching their faces and their chests. I asked, who are these people, O Jibreel? And Jibreel said, these are the people who ate the flesh of others. What does it mean by eating the flesh of other people? Backbiting. And trampled people's honor. They had no respect for other people's honor. And so such people will torture themselves in the hereafter. Another punishment that the Prophet ﷺ was shown. He said that I was taken for the journey and I passed by a group of people whose lips were being cut by scissors of fire. I asked, who are they? And he was told they are the khutaba. The khutaba of the people of the world, meaning the speakers, the orators, the lecturers, those who would order people to do good but forget themselves. And there are those who read the book, do they not understand? So while we are concerned about sharing this khair with other people, let's not forget ourselves. Let's not forget ourselves. Because this is a huge crime near Allah. That when we tell somebody to do something good, we should also make sure that we are observing it ourselves. And we gave Moses the scripture and made it a guidance for the children of Israel that you not take other than me as disposer of affairs. Rely upon Allah alone. O descendants of those whom we carried in the ship with Nuh, indeed he was a grateful servant. Allah reminds the Bani Israel that look at who your parents were, your ancestors were. You are the children of believers, of those who survived in the great flood. You are their children. And who was Nuh? He was a grateful servant. So what should you do? You should also be grateful. And we convey to the children of Israel in the scripture that you will surely cause corruption on the earth twice. And you will surely reach a degree of great pride and haughtiness. So when the time of promise came for the first of them, we sent against you servants of ours, those of great military might, meaning your enemy was stronger than you. The first occasion of your fasad, the first time you spread corruption on the earth, what happened? We sent against you a people who were mightier than you, stronger than you. And they probed even into the homes, meaning they spread everywhere in your lands and they fully assaulted you. And it was a promise fulfilled. Then we gave back to you a return victory over them. Look at how Allah changes the night into the day. Why is it that Allah changed the condition of the Bani Israel now? What happened? They committed great fasad, they caused great corruption. And then what happened? Allah sent people against them. And these people, they ruined them completely. When the Bani Israel did their islah, they reformed themselves. Then what happened? Allah gave them victory again. Allah gave them victory again. What do we learn from this? 
that we suffer when our sins increase. We suffer in this world when our sins have multiplied, when we have moved away from what Allah has ordered us to do, when we are creating corruption on the land, disturbing the lives of people, cheating them, harming them, spreading corruption. This is something that will cause us to suffer. This is something that will make our lives difficult and miserable. Otherwise, remember that those who believe in Allah, they will always be victorious, regardless of their numbers. The only situation when they will not be victorious is when their sins are greater than the sins of their enemy. When their akhlaq is worse than the akhlaq of their enemy. And this is what we need to be thinking about right now. That we complain a lot about the overall condition of the Muslims over the world. But we forget to reflect on ourselves. How honest are we when we're dealing with one another? How sincere and honest are we in our relationships? How respectful are we when we're dealing with other people? What is our work ethic? How is it that we are following the word of Allah? How is it that we are obeying Allah? What is our relationship with the people that we live amongst? You know, it, it seems like petty issues, but they have great ramifications. They have great consequences. So the people of the book before us, the same happened to them. That their situation was only reformed when they reformed themselves. And we reinforced you with wealth and sons and made you more numerous in manpower. This was when? When you reformed yourself. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do good, you do good for yourself only. Meaning when you reform yourself, when you fix your behavior, who do you benefit? Who do you benefit? Only yourself. Like for example, if a person corrects their eating habits, who is it that they will benefit? Themselves, right? Likewise, if a person is careful about their sleep pattern, then again, who are they going to benefit? Themselves. Likewise, when we fix our tongue, how? That we refrain from backbiting, from lying, from hurting other people, then who is it that we're going to benefit? Ourselves. When we are trustworthy, and when we're honest in our dealings, who is it that we're going to benefit? Ourselves. When we refrain from cheating others, then who is it that we will benefit? Ourselves. We think that when we do good, other people will make use of us. The fact is that we are firstly benefiting ourselves when we do good. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. Wa in asatum, falaha. And if you do evil, you do it for yourselves. The Prophet ﷺ said that if any one of you improves his deen, meaning his obedience to Allah, then his good deeds will be rewarded 10 times to 700 times for each good deed and a bad deed will be recorded as it is. So when a person fixes himself, does islah, like for example, we learn about sabr, all right? So patience. So when a person tries to be patient, at times when it's very easy to be angry, it's very easy to be hasty in our response to other people. So being patient in these times, who is it going to benefit? Who is it going to benefit? Us, ourselves. Right? We will benefit ourselves. Why? Because first of all, we are controlling ourselves. Right? We're not causing damage to the relationships that we have. And secondly, we will be rewarded. How much reward? 10 to 700 times. 10 to 700 times. And how is that determined? By the level of your effort, by the level of your sincerity. And on the other hand, we learn that when a person does evil, he does it only to himself. Meaning your moral decline will only ruin you. Then when the final promise came, we sent your enemies to sadden your faces and to enter the temple as they entered it the first time and destroyed it. And to destroy what they had taken over with total destruction. When you regressed, when you went back to your bad ways, to your bad habits, then what happened? You suffered again. You see, fasting in the month of Ramadan, what does it teach us? That if you can do it for 30 days... Inshallah, you can fix your condition for 30 years also, right? Because what happens with us? We do a good thing one day, and the next day we want to give ourselves a break. Ramadan says, no break. Don't allow yourself. You're not allowed, right? So you, you get better self-control. But what happens many times? We live through Ramadan, and then immediately after, we go back to our bad ways. So when we go back to our bad habits, 
then what are we going to face? The same consequences, right? That we suffered from before. Like for example, you could say these days that, oh, I'm eating so properly. I'm drinking so much water. At least I am. Right? Because I know I have to speak for two and a half hours without break. So I have to drink a lot of water. So the food is compromised, but the water is not compromised. Right? But generally what happens? You don't drink much water. Right? You know that the day is long, so you make sure that you're eating you know, food that is really going to help you. Not drain you of energy, but bring you energy. But if after Ramadan we go back to our poor eating habits, then what's going to happen? Yes, again, we'll be sleepy, we'll be lazy, we'll be tired, we'll be you know, miserable. Whose fault is that? Our fault. Our fault. You see, change is something that is conscious. You have to consciously make it. And it can never be effortless. You have to put in effort. And it doesn't happen that you make a change once in your lifetime and forever you will remain like that. No way. You need to keep you know, improving your condition. Why is it that Ramadan comes every year? Every year. Not every five years. Every year. Because what happens in 11 months? What happens in 11 months? We think, oh, I cannot fast. Fasting is not for me. But then what happens when Ramadan comes? Oh, fasting is for you. You have to fast. Right? So this is something normal. It happens with us. So what we learn from this is that change is something that is conscious. We have to put in effort to develop good habits and maintain good habits also. We have to put in effort. And this, you know, the study circle that, that we're conducting right now of reviewing the entire Qur'an, the meaning reflecting on the Qur'an, this is for this purpose that we remind ourselves of what we studied in the Qur'an. I mean, all of you here, most of you here, you've studied Surah Al-Isra in great detail before. Isn't it? But what happens? At least I forgot in Ahsantum Ahsantum Li Anfusikum. We forget it. We're human beings. I mean, as a principle, yeah, if you quiz me on this ayah, I could tell you. But do I really remember this in my life? That is something that I need to constantly remind myself of. Right? And this is why we are coming together every day in order to review one juz of the Qur'an. So the parts that we have forgotten, we can remind ourselves of them. And then we see over here that the second punishment... The second time that the Bani Israel suffered was worse than the first time. Because when a person doesn't learn from his mistakes and he keeps going back to them, then what happens? The eventual outcome is worse, worse than what it was initially. Then Allah said, it is expected that if you repent, your Lord will have mercy upon you. Meaning even if now you repent, Allah will show mercy to you. Because as long as you're living, you make a mistake, you keep going back to Allah, Allah will forgive you, Allah will show mercy to you. So never despair. But if you return to sin, we will return to punishment. And we have made hell for the disbelievers a prison bed. Meaning even if you manage to survive in this world, you cannot escape the punishment of the hereafter. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَامٍ Indeed, this Qur'an guides to that which is most suitable. Meaning he who wishes to find the right way, the best way in life, through its difficulties and trials, then what is it that he needs to turn to? The Qur'an. What is it that he needs to hold on to? The book of Allah. Because there is nothing else that can keep a person on the right track. Except the book of Allah. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَامٍ And it gives good tidings to the believers who do righteous deeds that they will have a great reward. So on the one hand, we have to hold on to the book of Allah. And on the other hand, when we're holding on to it, we don't just read it, review it, remember it, memorize it, write it. We also have to act upon it. Because those who do righteous deeds then they are the ones who will have a great reward. And that those who do not believe in the hereafter, we have prepared for them a painful punishment. This matter is very clear. There are two different ways. One way of life is holding on to the book of Allah, living by the book of Allah. And the other way of life is living by your desires. And the outcome of both is completely different. وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا And man supplicates for evil as he supplicates for good. And man is ever hasty. Meaning when he cannot bear the hardships of this life, what does he begin to pray for? Death. Right? Or more problems. He gets so frustrated that he starts asking for bad instead of good. Like for example, if a woman is upset with her husband, 
right? Over a petty issue. Divorce me. I mean, seriously? Calm down, relax, communicate, discuss the issue instead of jumping to completely cutting off the marriage. I mean, yes, there are situations when the marriage has to be ended. However, every situation is not like that. So many times it happens that when we become impatient, when we don't want to bear the pain of the trials that are coming our way, we become hasty. Allah says, we have made the night and day two signs. Look at the night, look at the day. Is the night eternal? No. Is the day eternal? No. Even if the night is very long, what will happen? A short day will come. And even if the day is very long, a short night will come. Even if it's just for 40 minutes or one hour or so, it will come. So circumstances in life also, they never remain the same. They keep changing. We erased the sign of the night and made the sign of the day visible that you may seek bounty from your Lord and may know the number of years and the account of time and everything we have set out in detail. And for every person, we have imposed his fate upon his neck. Meaning the deeds that a person has committed and the outcome of those deeds, they are tied to a person. There is no escape from them. Once we do an action, it is recorded in our deeds. And once we have performed an action, then its consequences we will have to face. Doesn't it happen in this life also? It happens. Like for example, you get angry and you say one bad word in front of your child, what's going to happen after 10 days? You're going to hear that word from your child. Right? It happens. I mean, people who don't admit their mistakes, if a mistake has been made and, and we don't reform it, we don't fix it, and we think like, oh, it was done, now it's over. No, it will haunt you. It will come back to you. If not in this life, for sure in the next life. So the deeds that we have performed and the outcome of those deeds, we can never escape them. Inescapable. They're tied to our neck. It's tied to our neck. You know like a necklace? Once it's around you, especially one that is really tight, it's just there. It's there. And we will produce for him on the day of resurrection a record which he will encounter spread open. And what is in this record? His life. Whatever he has done in his life, his deeds, good and bad. Iqra' kitabak. It will be said, read your record. Sufficient is yourself against you this day as accountant. Meaning a person, he can take his own hisab on the day of judgment. The result will be that obvious. It will be so obvious that a complicated hisab does not need to be done. It's so simple. It will be clear what a person deserves for the life that he has spent. Now here we really need to think about ourselves. That whatever we do, whatever we say, remember it is being written, it is being recorded. It is being recorded in our life book. Life book. And that life book, remember, we are going to face it one day. It's going to be put in front of us. The question is, is it worth reading? Because we have to read it. We have to face it. Is it worth facing? Is my life worth reading? Are my actions worth facing? My actions, whether I do them secretly or openly, are they worth reading? Because remember that nothing will remain confidential there. Nothing will remain hidden there. It will be exposed. Even the most hidden things in the heart that a person tried to conceal, never expressed, even they will be brought out. Even they will be laid out. So there is no hiding that day. So what we're doing, remember, it's not just going in our history, in our past. It's being recorded. And once it's being recorded, it's going to be replayed before our eyes. Is it worth facing? If it's not worth facing, if it's not worth reading, then there's two things we need to do. First of all, for whatever that has happened, repent to Allah. Seek forgiveness from Him. Seek forgiveness from Allah. Because when a person sincerely seeks forgiveness from Allah, begging Him for His forgiveness, then what happens? Those bad deeds are replaced with good deeds. What appears to be bad is converted to something that is good. So first of all, we need to make sincere tawbah. And this is why the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, that Allahumma khidli ma qaddamtu wa ma akhartu, wa ma a'lantu wa ma asrartu, wa ma أَسْرَفْتُ وَمَا أَنْتَ أَعْلَمُ بِهِ مِنِّي أَنْتَ الْمُقَدِّمُ وَأَنْتَ الْمُؤَخِرُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ That, O oh Allah, forgive me what I have sent ahead and what I have deferred. 
Because there are some bad things that we plan to do, right? We plan to do it. I can't do it this Ramadan. After Ramadan, we'll do it. Right? I mean, we plan to do bad things, and uh, sadly. So Allah, forgive me for all my sins, those that I have done already and those which will come later. Those that I've done secretly and those that I've done openly and those that you know better of than I do. I don't even know the sins that I have committed. So forgive me for all of my sins. Make this a regular dua. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to make this dua most frequently. So we should also make this dua most frequently, especially in this month of forgiveness, the month of Ramadan. And secondly, what we need to do is really look at ourselves and see that if it's not worth reading, if it's not worth facing, then it's not worth doing. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just like we leave certain words. Why? Because we are in front of people. They're watching us. We'll never say those words in front of them. Right? We change our actions. Why? Because we're in front of some people. Likewise, change your actions. Modify your behavior. Modify your speech. Correct your speech. Why? Because one day you have to face it. One day you have to see it. Have you ever been embarrassed seeing your baby pictures? Huh? And you got upset with your parents. Why did you have to take my picture in a diaper? Right? Or when you were giving me a bath, why did you have to do that? And you want to get rid of those pictures, but those pictures are not your property. And you can't. It upsets you. Now this is when you are a child, it's understood. Babies, they are changed, right? And people have fun even changing a baby, right? However, as an adult, what are we doing? Is it worth taking a picture off and being preserved for us to see later? If it's not worth it, don't do it. Don't do it. In a hadith we learned that once the Prophet ﷺ, he laughed, he smiled. And he said, do you know why I laughed? Why a smile? And the Sahaba said, no. He said, I thought about the conversation that will happen between the servant and his Lord on the Day of Judgment. That when Allah will call his servant to account, the servant will say that, oh my Lord, have you not guaranteed me protection against injustice? Meaning you promised that there will be no zulm on the Day of Judgment. Allah will say yes. So the servant will say that I do not deem valid any witness against me but my own self. Meaning, if you ask anybody else to come and witness against me, I would consider that to be unfair. So only I should be asked about the deeds that I have committed. So Allah will say, okay, well, then you will be the witness against yourself and your two angels who were appointed to record your deeds. And the person will agree that okay. And then the case will proceed. However, this person, his mouth would be sealed and his hands will speak, his feet will speak about what deeds he performed with his hands, with his feet. Kafa bi nafsika liyawma alayka hasiba. Our body will testify to the actions that we have committed. There is no hiding that day. There is no escape from the deeds that we have performed. So let's get our record cleaned up. Beg Allah for forgiveness. Ask Him to forgive for every single mistake that we have done. So that by the end of this month, inshallah, we come out as clean as a newborn baby. Clean. Clean and pure from sin. This is what we want. And this hadith is of Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم